how much has fintech benefited or have we had to raise questions about its foundations and well overall ability to handle some of the inbound yeah, so overall, the world of fintech and startups has really evolved, quite frankly, a lot in the last few weeks. I would say generally, which is so interesting, is that we're facing what many of us VCs call the opposite of the celery effect. So uh, prior to the SVB collapse, liquidity was running rampant, right? Startups were getting funding all over the place. Nowadays, startups are being a lot more cautious around what credit and debit looks like for them going forward. And that readily available capital just doesn't look as liquid, right, going yeah. forward. So ge generally, it's a very hard time to be a fintech, but there's a lot of solutions coming to market that are really exciting. You, of course, have Klarna on your portfolio. You'll have some other areas of fintech. Which will win out? Because we've seen the inflows to the likes of Brex and to some of the other Mercury banks. Are they the ones that are going to be winning? Yeah, so I would say startups generally have an amazing trend of trusting other startups, right? They all know that they're in the trenches together. The solutions like Klarna, Mercury, Brex are offering really good low interest rate products for startups to consider to support their banking and charter that they need. So I think cash deposits are key, mm -hmm. as well as offering just a really simple solution to those end consumers. A lot of this, though, of course, Ed, it's about confidence, not only confidence in the founders, confidence from the people putting money yeah. into these fintechs, founders, but confidence from the P VCs writing the checks. Yeah, and there is a spectrum of confidence we've had on this program, Andrea, across the venture capital community. Many actually saying, no, I'm plowing on. I'm writing checks. Areas like artificial intelligence, fintech, activity, it won't be at 2021 levels, but it's still there. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, so as the job of a venture capitalist, right, if we want to distill it down to its simplest form, our job is to write money, checks, and deploy that capital into startups. We can't just sit on it for too long. Though the dry powder is still there, the cautious nature of running a due diligence process has grown ever more present. And I would say just generally, the, startup, it, the startups are getting the funding. I would say generally, too, though, it's that they can't just rely on those debt facilities anymore as a backstop relative to what they were getting in venture equity dollars. So yeah, the VCs are deploying. They just aren't deploying as quickly as you said, Ed. Uh, later in the program, we're going to be talking about man's return to the moon, around the moon at least, with Artemis II. You were quite early, relatively speaking, into SpaceX. Lots of reports at the moment about the Saudis looking at investing in SpaceX What's your read on the valuation of that company and, and why it's still attractive to you? So SpaceX overall is one of the strongest companies we see in deploying what is going to be some really mission critical launches. And I think generally where the big belief we have in seeing a massive upside potential, though obviously it's still a private company and we have to see where it goes, is their ability to deploy launches successfully at a very high velocity in the coming years. I think there's a lot of you know, preeminent positivity around Elon's ability to do so. And so far, their success rate relative to other companies building mission launches has been much higher and much more repeatable than others. So overall, that overhead is still high. They're going to need to keep raising money. We definitely imagine several more rounds of venture funding to go there. But in terms of success and conversion rate to successful launches, it's been Elon and we continue to believe so. When you are at the moment seeing companies having to raise money, a lot of them are doing it either at flat valuation, some of them doing down rounds. We are hearing, though, of some companies that have cut their valuations from a 409A perspective and then maybe trying to raise them again. I know Instacart's in your portfolio. What do you make of well, companies that are having to realign the benchmark of how you value them? Yeah, so I would say generally, right, that concept of, of the 409A or that internal valuation that startups set is something that they utilize to create a price to issue stock options to new incoming employees. Now, initially, when startups start doing that value, um, they do it typically about once a year. Then as a company grows and it get, gets closer to a formal exit event, that valuation and that 409A is typically done typically more often than once a year, two or three times a year. So what that means is a company like Instacart might be doing their valuation reporting based on obviously the reports we're seeing a lot more than 
once a year in that level of frequency. So with that said, we definitely expect companies who experience high growth in quarterly increments or even in half year increments to see that fluctuation in their internal foreign a valuations as material things and uh, milestones happen within a company. So I would definitely expect that we see that kind of gyration happen across many of the later stage startups that are doing more frequent 409As. How close for Instacart is an exit therefore, do you think? Well, generally, you know, as I said, the closer you do get to an exit, the more frequent these 409A valuations do occur internally. So I would say typically companies that are on the cusp of a one year out give or take duration do make sense to be doing those valuations at this level of frequency. So that seems likely. I think a company like Instacart, like many others in the late stage, have really stacked their executive team and their product suite to be ready to face the public market and provide a really compelling narrative going into their IPO. So I think generally everyone's just rooting for them. And if it's not them, then one of the other large late stage companies to come in and be a strong catalyst for the IPO growth this year.